Every detail in the Susan Cox Powell case makes it more and more mysterious. The story is filled with family secrets, hatred, obsession, dreadful premonitions, and ends in a terrible tragedy. Susan Cox Powell was 28 years old. In 1991, she moved from New Mexico to Puyallup, Washington with her family when she was 10. As a teenager, she sang in the church choir. She had no choice. Susan's family was very religious and raised her according to all the prescribed canons. Susan graduated from Rogers High School in 2000 and, about nine months later, married Joshua Powell in a Mormon temple in Portland, Oregon. She was only 19 years old, and Josh was five years older. He and his family were also regular churchgoers. They met at an event held by the church in Puyallup for young singles. They had much in common, both grew up in large families in similar circumstances, never missing church services, and had similar views. This likely contributed to their quick marriage. Early in their marriage, the couple lived with Josh's father, Stephen Powell. By that time, Stephen had been divorced from Terrica or Terry Powell for eight years. Susan and Josh both found work at a nursing home. It was hard work, demanding dedication from the young couple. They could be called in at any time, even in the middle of the night. However, the pay was good, and they were content. Moreover, the couple appeared to be very kind, enjoying helping people and talking to those who clearly needed attention and companionship. They worked at the nursing home for a while before deciding to move to Utah, as their finances allowed them to live separately. In 2004, Susan and Josh left Washington. They chose Utah partly because Josh's sister, Jennifer Graves, and his mother, Terry, lived there. Susan also wanted to distance Josh from his father, whom she felt was negatively affecting their relationship. The more Josh talked to his father, the more distant he became from Susan. Their conversations often took place behind closed doors. In general, their relationship seemed strange to her. She hoped that the move to Utah would allow her to rebuild her connection with her husband. The couple settled in West Valley City, a suburb just 15 minutes southwest of Salt Lake City. Josh had his own business in West Valley City, creating websites and logos. He also worked as a programmer in a freight and warehousing company. Susan, despite her training in cosmetology, worked as a securities broker at Wells Fargo Bank. On January 19th, 2005, their first son, Charles, was born. Their second son, Brayden, was born two years later, on January 2, 2007. Soon after the birth of their second son, the couple's financial situation became critical, and Josh declared bankruptcy. Even before these events, friends had advised Susan to leave Josh. He had transformed from a pleasant, kind young man into an aggressor, capable of insulting his wife in front of others. According to Susan's family, there was at least one instance when Josh hit her, but she never filed a police report or sought medical help. From the outside, they appeared to be the perfect family, picnics, bike rides, and family trips. Only those close to Susan knew the dark truth about her marriage. In the summer of 2008, Susan struggled, searching for ways to improve her relationship with Josh, while he didn't make similar efforts. Instead, family quarrels at the Powell household grew more frequent. It seemed that everything Susan was interested in or believed in irritated Josh. He often took the opposite view. In dozens of emails sent to friends, Susan wrote about how Josh had transformed from a fun and affectionate man into a gloomy and capricious one. If he ever showed energy, he quickly directed it into arguments and shouting, often locking himself in a room, as if accumulating strength for the next argument. Susan also wrote, I'm sure he can change, and as soon as he can be the man I married, I will easily forget the hell we've been through. Susan worked and transferred her earnings into a joint account, but Josh was the one who controlled the money. He frequently scolded Susan for spending too much money on women's items and groceries for the family, despite his own inclination to make much larger expenditures. July 29, 2008. It is 1233 Mountain Time. In July 2008, on her insurance agent's advice, Susan made videos documenting valuable items in their house in case of fire, theft, and so on. 
In the video, Susan pointed out all of Josh's computers, expensive computer equipment purchased using Susan's credit card, a remote controlled car worth $3,000, a $300 remote control, a Nikon digital camera, and so on. Susan was raised to believe that having a complete family was the most important thing for her. She felt the need to be a good wife and mother, which is possibly why she tried to save her marriage despite deep conflicts. In August 2009, Susan and Josh started attending counseling with a family psychologist, but it was already too late. It didn't help them. Josh began threatening to take their sons and disappear, and Susan took these threats seriously. She might have been planning to escape, as she opened a personal bank account that only she had access to. On December 6, 2009, at noon, Susan went to church with her two sons for Sunday service. She returned with a friend named Joanna Owens, who stayed for lunch. That day, Josh seemed to be in an exceptionally good mood, and he was even making pancakes. Joanna thought that the atmosphere in the house was great, and they seemed like a wonderful family. Joanna left her friend's home around 5 p.m. At 8.30 p.m., a neighbor saw Josh return home with the children and sleds, suggesting that they had been on an outing. These were all the witness accounts for December 6th. On December 7, 2009, a daycare worker named Debbie Caldwell noticed that Susan's two sons, Charlie and Braden, were not in their group. Susan always informed her if she didn't plan to bring the children to daycare, but on this day, Susan did not answer her phone, nor did she show up at work. Josh was also absent. Debbie and Susan were friends who communicated well, not just about the children, so Debbie decided to go to the Powell family's home to find out what was happening. She knocked on the door, but no one answered. She couldn't see any footprints in the snow. No one has left the house today, Debbie thought at the time. Debbie called Josh's sister, Jennifer, and soon Jennifer and Terry, the mother of Josh and Jennifer, arrived at the missing Powell family's home. Jennifer and Terry were sure that the family had not planned to leave. Susan always notified them of such plans in advance. Worried relatives called the police. The officers broke a window and entered the house, but no one was inside. The house seemed normal, according to Jennifer. There were no signs of a break-in or struggle. It seemed as if the homeowners had left on their own, which was supported by the absence of their family car in the garage. Only Susan's purse, along with her wallet and documents, was left in the house. Inside the purse, they found a small key and her warm winter boots, which she usually wore in cold weather. There were warm boots inside on this snowy, cold day. Detective Ellis Maxwell took on the case, arriving at the home that morning. Detective Maxwell immediately ruled out the possibility of robbery or abduction. The strangest thing was that two fans were running inside the deserted house, positioned side by side, blowing hot air onto the carpet by the couch. The couch and the carpet below remained wet. The Powell family was declared missing. Searches for the missing family continued for over 10 hours. Suddenly, a minivan with the Powell family confidently turned off the road as it approached the house's garage. Josh got out of the car with his two sons. Susan was not with them. The police promptly detained Josh and asked him several questions. Josh told the police that he had returned from a camping trip with his sons, which he had wanted to do for a long time. They had gone to a place called Simpson Springs in western Utah, 136 kilometers away from their home. They had left on their trip yesterday after midnight, meaning Josh had decided to take his two very young children camping in the freezing cold at night. The police rightfully asked him why he chose to go on a nighttime camping trip with his children. Josh replied that they often did this, and the boys loved going on a night trip. He had no idea where Susan was, he was sure she had spent a normal day, including going to work and preparing to welcome them home. Her whereabouts were a mystery to him, just like everyone else. Josh was taken to the police station for questioning. During the interrogation, Josh claimed that he had asked Susan if she wanted to go on the camping trip with them, and she declined, saying she was tired. Susan was sleeping when Josh packed the necessary items and left the house with their sons. According to Josh, he never saw his wife again. On December 6th, it was a Sunday, 
and on the 7th, it was Monday, so you should have gone to work in the morning. Detective Maxwell asked, aren't you supposed to go to work in the morning? The road, preparing for the trip, setting up camp, all of that takes time, and you only have a few hours left for sleep. Josh replied that he simply forgot which day of the week it was, even though his wife and children had gone to church on Sunday, he still thought it was a Saturday. The detective noted that Josh didn't seem concerned at all about his wife's fate. The family's minivan was inspected, and while there was a lot of camping gear in it, nothing suspicious was found except for the missing cell phone. There were no traces of blood. On December 8th, Josh came in for another interview. He often remained silent, had long pauses between answers, and seemed to have trouble recalling a lot of important information. Everyone noted that Josh was typically very talkative, even excessively so, but not during the interviews. He never asked if the police had any information about his missing wife, showed no concern for her, and didn't offer to help. His behavior was suspicious. That day, not only Josh was interviewed, but his children as well. Charlie, the older son, provided much more information during his interview. Josh wasn't willing to cooperate with the detective. Charlie, who was almost five years old at the time, was quite talkative. He was asked with whom he had gone on a night camping trip. Charlie answered that he went with his dad, his little brother, and his mom. Charlie stated, Mommy is where the crystals are. This information was immediately relayed to the detective who continued to question Josh. When asked about it, Josh said that Charlie was lying and often made up things that weren't connected to reality. Later, Chuck and Judy Cox, Susan's parents, reported that their younger grandson, Braden, said that his mom rode in the trunk of the car. However, there was no evidence or confession. Detective Maxwell had no choice but to release Josh for the time being. Crime scene investigators thoroughly searched the house. The next step in Detective Maxwell's investigation was to visit the place where Josh, along with his children and possibly Susan, had gone camping. Fresh snow had fallen, concealing most of the evidence. Nevertheless, they initiated an extensive search in that area as well. As they searched the house, they seized Josh's external hard drives, which were encrypted with complex passwords that no one could crack. Josh, being a programmer, was capable of setting up strong protection, but the question remained, why? The crime scene investigators examined the couches and the carpet using special reagents. They discovered that the couches and the carpet had been recently cleaned with cleaning products. There was a small blood stain on the couch, which was identified as Susan's blood. Her blood was also found near the end of the carpet. However, finding blood in the house wasn't direct evidence of murder, as the blood could have been there long before these events, and the amount was minimal. The investigation continued, and the entire town was covered in purple ribbons as a reminder of Susan, and that everyone was concerned about her except for her husband. He seemed to have no worries regarding her and appeared to be trying to maintain the image of a worried spouse, eventually deciding to move to another state to live with his father. A few weeks after Susan's disappearance, Josh decided to make a statement on television, which was apparently encouraged by his father. In this statement, he said, Susan had a troubled childhood, mostly due to physical violence from her mother. She was cruel. Escaping from this situation and restrictions, she lost her mind. She's a hysterical, immoral woman. Josh also claimed that Susan had been waiting for the family to leave so she could run away with her lover. Almost simultaneously with the disappearance of Susan in Salt Lake City, a 30-year-old man named Stephen Coucher also went missing. Josh and his father, Stephen, claimed that Susan had run away with him to Brazil to start fresh and create a new family. Strangely, Josh had been asked many times if he had any clue about his wife's whereabouts, and he had always denied it. But now, he was insisting that he knew who she had run away with, where she had gone, and why. This information shocked Susan's close family and relatives, who knew it was a dirty lie and an attempt to tarnish their daughter's reputation. In February 2010, Susan's family held a press conference to tell the public about the difficulties in their marriage, the hatred from Josh, and to give insight into who Josh was as a person. After this public appearance, the police received a call from Scott Hartman. 
It turns out that about a year before Susan disappeared, in December 2008, at a corporate Christmas party, Scott overheard a troubling conversation with Josh. His wife, Amber Hartman, corroborated his story. Josh and Scott were discussing how to commit the perfect murder, where to hide a body, and reminiscing about crime TV shows. Josh had mentioned that the most reliable way was to hide a body somewhere difficult to reach, particularly in a mine. Detective Maxwell immediately recalled Charlie's statement, Mom is where the crystals are. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the state of Utah was home to numerous silver, gold, zinc, copper, and other valuable mineral deposits. Mines were actively established in the state, and Utah's economy relied on mining for some time. Many of these mines are now abandoned, and verifying what's inside these shafts is no easy task since there are hundreds, even thousands of them. The police were gearing up for a challenging search operation, particularly focusing on the mines. During the summer of 2010, searches in the desert riddled with deep mines continued. These searches were extremely arduous. Hundreds of personnel worked in the mines, and over 6,000 work hours were spent in the search for Susan. They started with the mines near the campsite where Josh was presumed to have been. After several months of searching, they found a mine with something unusual. It had been doused with gasoline. Toxic fumes in the mine prevented the police from proceeding further. According to online reports, searches in this particular mine were halted, but investigations continued in other areas. Without a body, it was almost impossible to establish Josh's guilt. At that time, nobody knew just how dangerous he might be and how crucial it was to arrest and isolate him as more than one life was at stake. A confession was needed. Josh forbade Susan's parents from seeing their grandchildren, repeating to the press that they were cruel, despotic, and terrible people. One summer day in 2011, Stephen, Josh's father, informed a reporter that Susan's diaries contained information about betrayal and running away. Josh remained emotionally distant, convinced that his wife had abandoned him and their children. Sergeant Gary Sanders of the Criminal Investigation Division, who was working with the city police at the time, received a search warrant for Stephen Powell's house on August 24, 2011. The primary purpose of the search was to find Susan's diaries. While they did find Susan's diaries, they contained nothing of interest, as if she had known that others might read them. However, the diaries of the homeowner himself were discovered, along with other notebooks filled with entries. In these writings, he confessed his love for Susan. His obsession with his daughter-in-law was evident in disturbing ways. In the bedroom closet, they found Susan's soiled undergarments, used tampons, sanitary napkins, and other personal hygiene items, all neatly packaged in plastic bags with dates. But that wasn't all. It turned out that Stephen had been spying on her and constantly taking photographs. Over 4,000 photographs he took of her were found in his bedroom closet. Hundreds of disturbing video recordings were discovered as well. Susan likely felt this and, hence, decided to move with her husband to another state. Now, investigators began to suspect Stephen. While there wasn't direct evidence of his guilt in Susan's case, he was arrested and sentenced to two and a half years in prison for having explicit images of young girls, his neighbors, whom he had been spying on through their windows. It was a dangerous place for little boys to be, so Susan's parents gained temporary custody of the children. Josh was left alone. Investigators hoped that Stephen would talk behind bars and make a deal, but he, on the contrary, became more reserved. At the same time, something interesting came to light. It turned out that Susan had a small safe at work, and the key found in her purse belonged to it. Inside, there was a videotape that she had recorded at the request of an insurance agent, but according to other sources, it might have been a divorce lawyer instead. She filmed expensive items in the house so that Josh couldn't hide them without her knowledge, claiming them as his own later. The words at the beginning of the video carried a completely different meaning. Susan likely didn't want a divorce, at least not back then, likely influenced by her religious upbringing. She told her husband that he needed to change and return to his former self or they would get divorced. Although Susan didn't desire a divorce, she was prepared for it. 
Inside the safe was also a letter labeled Wool with the message, Do not give this to Josh. In the letter, she detailed her reasons for seeking a divorce, their constant fights, her husband's selfishness, failure to provide money, even the money she had earned, his unhelpfulness, his hostility, and many other reasons. She also wrote, I want everything to be documented, that our marriage is in serious trouble, and if I die, it's not an accident, even if it looks like it. Don't believe my husband, protect the children. She not only predicted her disappearance, but effectively named her murderer. In the margins, she wrote, tell my children that I love them very much. The note became the primary piece of evidence, but it still wasn't sufficient for a murder charge. Without a body, physical evidence, witnesses, or confessions, the case remained one of disappearance rather than murder. Towards the end of 2011, while examining Josh's computer, it was discovered that he had been actively collecting information about a mountain called Topaz, located about 50 kilometers from where Josh claimed to have camped with the children that night. Could Susan be somewhere near there? Thanks to this new information, massive searches were launched, now with the involvement of search dogs in the mountainous region. A search dog picked up a trail and led them to a small cave, next to which were ashes and coals. Recently, something had been burnt there, possibly Susan's remains. The ashes and coals were sent for analysis. Susan's close family members waited anxiously. It was a grueling test of time. Experts declared that these were not human remains. It was as if the investigation had hit a wall. This was a major disappointment, but it didn't last long because soon there was another twist. Also, at the end of 2011, it was revealed that immediately after Susan disappeared, Michael Powell, Josh's younger brother, jumped his 1997 Ford Taurus car for just $100, even though it was still in decent condition. Josh's minivan had not shown any evidence or bloodstains. It's possible that his brother helped him transport a body. The car hadn't been dismantled yet. Police with tracking dogs arrived at the Linden Auto Pendleton landfill in the state of Oregon. The dogs pointed to the trunk. They were trained to search for traces of a decomposed body. There had been a corpse in the car. That's what the dogs indicated. During questioning, Michael remained calm at first until he heard that his car was intact and being investigated by forensic experts. At that moment, he lost his composure. Then, something unbelievable happened. The identity of the DNA found in the trunk was unknown, but it definitely wasn't Susan. This is the strangest moment in this case. Whose DNA was discovered? Was there a body in the trunk, and if so, whose? Why did Michael react so strongly and take such actions with the car? Perhaps he had his own secrets? In any case, Michael was released in relation to Susan's case. In 2012, Josh fought for custody of his children, but the boys continued to live with Susan's parents. The judge decided not to change this, and Susan's parents prepared for the court hearing for weeks, hiring the best lawyer to scrutinize their son-in-law. It turned out that in his youth, Josh had been mentally unstable, threatening his mother with a knife, wanting to kill himself, and mistreating animals. Suspicion about his wife's disappearance played a role. Only after psychiatric evaluation and passing a polygraph test, and if all results were clean, could the children be returned to him. Josh declined. Josh still had the opportunity to visit his children. On February 5th, 2012, there was the first meeting at Josh's rented house in Washington. The children entered the house, but the social worker, Elizabeth Griffin Hall, who was supposed to be present during the meeting, wasn't allowed inside. A few seconds after the door closed, the children began screaming loudly, and the woman immediately called 911. It was too late, she smelled gasoline and moved away from the house. An explosion occurred, and the entire house was engulfed in flames instantly. The fire was intense, and it took rescuers several hours to enter the house. No one survived. Of course, it was a horrifying trap, but that wasn't the worst part. Both children had wounds on their heads from an axe. Josh left a final message before doing this. Josh Powell, I can't live without my sons. I'm sorry to everyone I've hurt. 
Detective Harry Sanders of the Criminal Investigation Division was sure there was not a shred of sincerity in those words. Susan's killer, Josh Powell, knew that his children knew everything. They were growing up, and one day they could tell their grandparents everything. He fought for them only to control them. He didn't love his children. He punished them in this way. He had nothing to lose himself, as he knew he would soon be exposed. Enormous resources were poured into this investigation, but Josh always seemed one step ahead. Investigators knew that Josh was very close to his brother Michael, and he bequeathed 93% of his life insurance to him. The remaining 7% was split between his other brother and sister. Michael was interrogated intensively. On February 11, 2013, Michael took his own life, jumping from the 7th floor. There was one last person who might know something, Stephen, Josh, and Michael's father, but he stubbornly remained silent. In July 2018, he passed away from a heart attack in the hospital at the age of 68. Chuck Cox, Susan's father, believes that answers about his daughter's fate might be on Josh's encrypted hard drives, which remain unhackable. They are still working on them. So far, Susan Cox Powell's case remains unsolved and cold.